This is a revision video for the WAVES topic of GCSE Combined Science. Since this is quite a big topic, there is a separate video that covers the additional content required for GCSE Physics, also known as Triple Science, but this video covers all of the content for GCSE Combined Science. 40% of the marks in the GCSE Science exams are for pure factual recall, so this video is designed to ensure that you have thoroughly learned the key points from the specification. Download the worksheet from the description below, quiz yourself, and then use this video to check your answers. Firstly, you should be able to draw and label a transverse wave. So the transverse wave is the one that looks like a sine wave. And on this, you should be able to label the peak as the highest part of the wave, the trough as the lowest part, the wavelength you can measure between any two equivalent points. So that could be peak to peak, it could be trough to trough, it could be from midpoint to midpoint. But if you do go for this, be very careful to make sure that you are including a complete wave. Um, you can quite easily end up only measuring half a wave if you go where the wave is going up and where the wave is going down. So personally, I would stick for peak to peak or trough to trough. And then the amplitude is half the total height of the wave. So it can be measured anywhere from the midpoint where the wave starts to its maximum displacement. Examples of transverse waves include waves on the surface of water and then any electromagnetic spectrum wave. So that's visible light, it's radio waves, microwaves, ultraviolet, all of those. The wavelength of a wave is the distance between any two equivalent points on two adjacent waves. So in other words, the distance between the two peaks or the two troughs. The amplitude of a wave is half the height of that wave, and we can define it as the maximum distance that the wave has been displaced away from that midpoint. The frequency of a wave is the number of waves that pass a particular point per second. And it's the reciprocal of the time. So in other words, if you know the frequency, then one divided by frequency is time. And if you know the time, so the period of one wave, then one divided by time is frequency. Frequency is measured in hertz and hertz are equivalent to seconds to the minus one and time is measured in seconds. All waves transfer energy, so we can think of wave speed as the speed at which that energy is transferred through the medium. And when we say medium, we mean whatever the wave is travelling through, so for instance the air. To calculate wave speed, you multiply together frequency and wavelength. Wave speed and wavelength are just a speed and a length applied to a wave, so the units are metres per second and metres. There are a couple of different ways that you can measure the speed of sound, but the most common way is by using an echo. So firstly, you need a hard reflective surface that sound is going to bounce off, like a brick wall. And you need to measure the distance from yourself to that brick wall. Then you need a short, sharp sound that is going to easily reflect an echo. So this could be something like a gunshot, like you would use to start a 100 metre sprint. And you need to simultaneously make that sound and start the stop clock. Then you're going to listen and wait until you hear the echo. And when you hear it, that's when you stop the stop clock. Then you can use the equation speed is distance divided by time to work out the speed of the sound wave. But remember that when you do this, you're going to need to use double the distance from you to the brick wall. So the reason for that is that the sound wave is going to move away from you, hit the wall and then be reflected back. So it's actually covering double the distance. The alternative way you could do this is using a pair of linked microphones and a speaker. So you can have a setup where the speaker makes a noise and one of the microphones is right next to it, so that goes into your computer, and then the other microphone is much further away and you measure how long does it take for the sound to get to that microphone and then you can do the same thing. Our next question is about the 8th required practical in GCSE Physics, which is also the 20th required practical in GCSE Combined Science. So in order to work out the wave speed of ripples, there are two ways you can do it. And the main one is by using together the frequency and the wavelength. So we know that wave speed is frequency times wavelength. And so what you want to do is calculate these two values first and then use them together to calculate wave speed. So in order to calculate frequency, firstly, we use a stop clock and we time how many waves happen in a given period of time. And then once we know that, we can do one divided by the time period for one wave in order to work out the frequency. Or if you're making your waves using an oscillator, which you usually are, you can probably just read the frequency off that oscillator. 
In order to measure the wavelength, you need to put a ruler alongside your ripple tank and take a photograph of it. And then you can literally use that ruler to measure the distance between two wave fronts because you'll be able to see darker stripes where the peaks of the waves are and lighter stripes where the troughs are. When you're doing this, it's much more accurate if you can measure more waves. So, for instance, measure the length of 10 waves and then divide by 10 to find the wavelength of one wave. Ideally, you want to work out each one of these values multiple times so that you can calculate a mean value. Then we can use the equation wave speed is frequency multiplied by wavelength. Alternatively, you could use the time period for the waves to travel the length of your entire screen or your whole tank and the length of that screen or tank. And you could put these together and say that the wave speed is going to be the distance divided by the time. Longitudinal waves are actually really, really hard to draw, and I have never seen a single question asking you to do so. But in order for you to be able to label one, you needed to be able to draw one. So you should have a longitudinal wave that looks something like this. We've got areas where the lines are closer together and then gradually they spread out and then gradually they come closer together again. The points where the lines are close together are the compressions and the points where they're far apart are the rarefactions. And if we wanted to measure the wavelength of the wave, we would go from the closest point of the compressions to the closest point of the compressions or the most spread out points of the rarefactions to the most spread out points of the rarefactions. Longitudinal waves include sound waves. If you change the frequency of light, then this affects the colour. So a high frequency light would be blue, whereas a low frequency light would be red. Changing the amplitude of a light wave will affect its brightness because amplitude is a measure of how much energy a wave is carrying. If you change the frequency of a sound wave, you affect its pitch. So a high frequency is a high pitched sound and a low frequency is a low pitched sound. And if you change the amplitude of a sound wave, because it's affecting the amount of energy that's carried, that affects its volume. When an electric field comes into contact with a magnetic field, this generates a type of transverse wave called an electromagnetic wave. And these can be used to transfer energy. They form a continuous spectrum. And what that means is that there isn't a fundamental difference between a radio wave and a microwave. We just assign different names based on the particular frequency and the particular wavelength. So in the same way that you would look at a rainbow and different people might disagree about where red became orange, you could look at an electromagnetic spectrum and the difference between ultraviolet and X-rays and gamma rays is kind of up for debate. The seven types of electromagnetic wave which you do need to know in order are radio waves, microwaves, infrared radiation, visible light, ultraviolet, x-rays and gamma rays. And if you don't already know them in order, you should look up the electromagnetic spectrum song. Human eyes are only capable of perceiving visible light out of this spectrum. While radio waves have the longest wavelengths, and these can be up to maybe a kilometre, gamma rays have much, much shorter wavelengths, and this could be as small as 10 to the minus 15 metres. Frequency goes the other way around. So as the wavelength gets longer, of course, you have fewer waves passing per second. So this means that radio waves have a very low frequency, whereas gamma rays have a much higher frequency. Radio waves can be used for TV and radio. Microwaves can, of course, be used in microwave ovens, but they're also used for satellite communication and sending text messages. Infrared radiation can be used for heaters, for cooking food and for infrared cameras. Visible light is used within fibre optic communication, so beams of visible light are literally bounced off fibre optic cables. Ultraviolet light comes in suntan beds and also in energy efficient lamps. And X-rays and gamma rays are both used for medical imaging and also for medical treatments, for instance, cancer therapies. The 10th required practical for GCSE physics, which is the 21st required practical for GCSE combined science, involves measuring the radiation of infrared from different surfaces. So, for instance, a black matte surface versus a pale shiny surface. So to begin with, you need a number of either hollow cubes or cans that have the same dimensions and the same overall shape, but have different surfaces. So they need to have the same dimensions because otherwise this could affect the speed with which infrared radiation is being given off and we wouldn't have valid data. So this is a control variable. But of course, you need different surfaces because that's your independent variable. That's the thing that we are investigating and changing. You're going to fill each one of those cans or hollow cubes with the same amount of hot water. And this is going to increase the amount of infrared radiation being given off and make it more easy to detect. 
Then you're going to use a ruler to make sure that your sensor or your camera is always the same distance away from the cans, because otherwise, of course, that will affect the amount of infrared radiation that's being detected, because some of it will just dissipate to the surroundings. You can then use your infrared detector or sensor to detect how much infrared radiation is being given off. It's possible that if you didn't have access to this equipment, you might have done an equivalent experiment in which you filled the cans with hot water and then you measured the temperature as it gradually decreased. But this isn't actually a great experiment because there are lots of other factors that could influence the rate at which the temperature changes. So you're much better off describing how to use an infrared sensor or camera instead. Dark matte surfaces are much better at absorbing electromagnetic waves, including infrared, than pale shiny surfaces. Your reflection diagram should look a bit like this. So you'll see we have the instant ray coming in to begin with, and between the instant ray and the normal, we have the angle of incidence. The normal is an imaginary construction line that we draw in order to allow us to calculate what the size of that angle is. And it's a really common mistake that we see people drawing the angle of incidence between the ray and the mirror rather than between the ray and the normal. So I always say to classes, well, what would be the point of you drawing the normal if you weren't going to use it? So make sure that your angle of incidence is in the right place. Then coming away from the normal, we have the reflected ray, and between the reflected ray and the normal, we have the angle of reflection. And of course, the point of this diagram is that the angle of incidence and the angle of reflection are exactly the same as one another. Here's my glass or perspex block and my instant ray going into it. The normal is still drawn at 90 degrees compared to the angle that's being hit. And again, the angle of incidence goes between the instant ray and the normal. Then we have our refracted ray. Now, because the glass block is more dense than the air that the ray has come from, the ray is going to refract towards the normal. So that means that my, um, my angle of refraction, which is between the refracted ray and the normal, is smaller than my angle of incidence was. And then because this is a rectangular block, when it refracts out the other side, it's going to exit at exactly the same angle at which it entered. Light changes speed as it enters media of different density. So because the glass block is more dense, the light slows down. When a light ray enters a block at an angle, the side entering first slows down earlier. And so the entire ray pivots, kind of like if you're ice skating and holding hands with somebody and then they stop and you sort of pivot around them. Now, in a rectangular prism, the refraction on either side is equivalent because the two sides are parallel to each other. But in a triangular prism, the sides are at different angles. So this allows us to make a spectrum. The red light refracts less than the purple light does. And so this ends up with the light being split apart. So the white light is split apart into different colours and we make a spectrum. And this happens because of the different wavelengths of the light. So the longer wavelength light refracts less than the shorter wavelength light. Radio waves are produced by oscillations in electrical circuits, but they can also induce oscillations in electrical circuits. When radio waves are absorbed, they create alternating current that has the same frequency as the frequency of the wave. Gamma rays originate from changes in the nucleus of atoms. Ultraviolet waves can cause your skin to age. So in other words, if you spend time on a sunbed, you're likely to end up looking a bit wrinkly and older, but also they massively increase your chance of getting skin cancer. Both X-rays and gamma rays can cause mutation to DNA, and this, of course, can also lead to all sorts of different kinds of cancer. Radiation dose is measured in sieverts. Thanks for watching, and I hope that this has helped you in your revision for the waves topic. If you're taking GCSE Physics, otherwise known as Triple Science, don't forget to also check out the separate video for all the Triple Science content. If you found this useful, don't forget to like and subscribe for more GCSE Physics videos coming soon.